السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم إمام قسين السلام عليكم إمام قسين وثاس السلام عليكم سيدي يونس تفضل مجد عفواس وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته الفاتحة أعوذ بالله السمين العلي من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم على آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم اللهم صل صلاة كاملة وسلم سلاما تاما على سيدنا محمد الذي تنحل بالأقد وتنفرج بالقرب وتقضى بالحوائج وتنال بالرغيب ويستسقى الغبام بوجهه الكريم صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه في كل لمحة ونفس بعدد كل معلوم لك ربنا زدنا علما وارزقنا فهما وأزدنا بصالحين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ودخلنا الجنة مع الأبرار يا عزيز يا غفار يا رب العالمين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ربنا تقبل منا بسر أسرار سورة الفاتحة شكرا جزيلا سيدي يونس السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته to everyone else yes we are following on tonight إن شاء الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وصحابه وبارك وسلم we following on with the next part of the third level let me very briefly, and when I say briefly, I mean briefly, um, just touch on what we have, what we have dealt with thus far. Um, we said at level one <coughs> of our nafs, we are little more than animals. We behave in totally unacceptable ways. We do the wrong. We don't care whether we do it. Um, and that is the worst stage a human being can be at. It shows what influence the nafs has on a person who is at this level. Now clearly, those of us who are sitting around, uh, listening and participating in, 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 in this uh, Zoom session of ours, um, we don't fall in this category. Alhamdulillah. We can be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having guided us that we have moved out of this stage, this terrible stage where we are not much more than animals. Now, I without going into the detail, we are told in this first stage, we must eat less, talk less and sleep less and uh, we must continuously recite in this first stage, La ilaha illallah. Should we only do it in the first stage? No. We should do it throughout all the stages, eat less, talk less, sleep less, and we must re continuously recite La ilaha illallah. I'm very briefly recapping. Um, then the second area, uh, second level was the, the level of where the nafs, we've managed to 
tame the nafs and we have realized that we need to be improving our lives to become better people and we are not we trying now to become better muslims and to follow and obey the commands of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there are we still have all those terrible qualities that we had in the first stage it's less so but we still one foot in the the the, the first level and one foot in the next level and key in this stage uh, that we've been advised by the scholars is to focus on the quality of sincerity and humility of course whatever other qualities we can fight we should also fight and we have been told that other than eat, eating less talking less and sleeping less we should now add dhikr do regular dhikr fikr remembrance of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala contemplation uh, and we must isolate ourselves from people generally we must find time to uh, be alone with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in this stage what is absolutely crucial if we don't do this we get stuck here in this level and we won't be able to make progress if we don't make sincere toba toba for all the things that we have done uh, that were wrong we were disobedient to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we must make sincere toba uh, that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should forgive us and there's a debt imam ghazali says there's a debt that's outstanding to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you can't just make toba you have to pay your outstanding debt and one of the ways of it is to sincerely appeal to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness uh, istighfar um, but importantly when we have harmed people Allah does not forgive us for the harm that we have done to people we must seek those people's forgiveness and we must pay them whatever we owe them not only in money and material terms but must we must make up for the harm that we've done them you can't just uh, ask for forgiveness and walk on you actually have to find out whether you have settled your debt with them and hopefully inshallah if you are sincere they will forgive you in the second level we said you must now regularly keep your tongue moist with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's name that is the name that covers all the other names so when we describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Al-Alim, uh, Samir, uh, Basir, all the other names that we uh, uh, describe Allah with, this name covers every single name because it refers to the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, level three we started uh, 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 last week it's the inspired nafs mulhama now, i'm not going to repeat everything it's easy to get uh, uh, to to just repeat everything but we have a, a, a session that we should should be dealing with tonight is that we have managed to partly tame the nafs it's not so reckless and wild anymore like it used to be uh, it's a bit more obedient now uh, we don't willfully sin we in fact now doing our ibadah and we're trying to do all the things that the sharia makes uh, 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 obligatory to us we're trying to do that as best as we can we made it clear in terms of what the scholars have said um, and that is in order to make progress you have to be attached to a sheikh because we are now one foot in the material world the level of the sharia deals with the physical actions the material world and our material obligations and we are about to enter the spiritual world the world of the ghaib the world of the unseen there you can't 
enter and make progress on your own because you know nothing about the unseen world. Nothing. Because the unseen world cannot be known through your five senses, your eyes, your ears, your tongue, and all the other things. The unseen world is a world where you have to have special qualities, and we'll discuss some of that later on, and those qualities must be developed in order for you to make progress. And whilst you don't have it, you need to have somebody who does have it, and that is a Kamil Sheikh to guide you through this path. And we said that the uh, uh, one quality that stands out that we should work on uh, is the quality of sabr. Now, I've taken Imam Ghazali's book on Minhajul Abidin, and I want to thank um, our brother uh, Fasih um, Peterson for, for having uh, uh, um, posted the book on the... Uh, on, 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 on this platform, and we ask people to make time to go through it, because Imam Ghazali in this book deals step by step in very, very, very detail on what are the diseases of the various organs in the body. And I've used his, um, his book as a basis um, for dealing with the various diseases of some of the limbs and organs of our bodies and also the cures that he suggests. So, <coughs> what does Imam Ghazali say? Imam Ghazali says that's three methods that we must use to fight the nafs. And the first one is don't pursue all those lusts, lust is maybe a strong word, but the satisfaction of your greed, of your desires, you must fight that. Don't just give in to it. Whether it is for food or money or anything else um, that is so important in your life, you must find a way of fighting that. Don't just be a willing participant and let your nafs just control you. And one of the ways he says is you must also fight the indulgence in luxuries. So if something is a luxury and you know what luxuries are, we all know what luxuries are, um, whether it has to do with clothes or your house or your lifestyle or your car or your house, we know what luxuries are. He says that one should fight that. One shouldn't pursue the, the, the need to actually indulge in all of those luxuries. And a powerful way, he says, is don't give the nafs an easy ride. You must load the nafs and burden it. Create things that you know that the nafs doesn't like. Say, for example, uh, you, 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 you are um, idle now, you've got nothing specific that you want to do, then go and sit and tell yourself, I'm going to make dhikr, or I'm going to read the Quran, or I'm going to read a, 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 a book, a beneficial book, of course. Um, or even if it is that you have to participate in spiritual activity um, that you are not normally busy with. But this is one of the ways of making sure the nafs has got another focus. It's not waiting to tempt you to go and do the wrong things and, 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 and what you would normally have done. So if you are busy with good things, then the nafs is under pressure. And he makes it quite clear that you can't do this on your own. You must always seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's protection. And he says the cultivation, the development of taqwa. Maybe we should 
at some point just speak on taqwa. Taqwa will require a, a co complete session on its own. But he says, for our purposes, that certainty of belief, that absolute certainty of belief, not just say with your mouth, but have it as something that comes from your heart, something that you feel, something that you taste, that taqwa, you must, you must try and develop that. It's one of the powerful tools that you're going to require in this stage. And l let me make it clear that this is the most difficult stage. Of all the stages, this is where many people, they start, they may be fortunate enough to get to the third level, but they don't go beyond this because it is such an extremely difficult stage to uh, 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 make progress in consistently. Then he comes, Imam Ghazali comes to the specifics now. Now, yes, we're going to talk about the eyes, the ears, the tongue, the stomach, the heart, the private parts. We're not going to talk about the private parts. Uh, I, 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 I wouldn't know how to present that as a as as uh, as a topic for discussion, um, so I'm going to leave that one out. But the eyes, the ears, the tongue, the stomach, the heart, those, all of those, we're going to deal with specifically now, which means it's going to take a bit of time. Now, the first thing that you will say to yourself is, "But we know what the problems of the eyes are. We mustn't look at the wrong things." We know what's the problem of the ears. We mustn't listen to the wrong things. The tongue, we mustn't slander. Uh, stomach, we must eat halal food. Um, and the heart, we must purify. So there you got all the answers. You know. But let's hear what Imam Ghazali says. It will be a repeat of what we've done. We've done much of this when we dealt with the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of all seeing, uh, all hearing, um, uh, Al-Kalam, uh, the one who speaks. Uh, all of these things we've done, we've done the heart too. But let's hear what Imam Ghazali says to us um, when it comes to the influence and how the nafs uses these different limbs within our body and to try and control it. And when the nafs controls your eyes, then ultimately it determines how you use your eyes. Let me pause there and hear if there are any comments uh, at this stage before I move on. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Aisha, mashallah. <laughs> Good to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> Shukran. Yes, um, Tasali, the tongue, eh, it's difficult to control. I, I can understand. I can understand why Imam Ghazali said the eyes. I mean, the eyes, you can look down. Um, the ears, you can try not to listen and ignore, but the tongue is the most difficult one. <laughs> Yeah. You are so right. Uh, it 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 uh, it's um, seen as the most dangerous organ, the tongue, and many people, on the use of the tongue, the careless use of the tongue, will be going straight to Jahannam just because the way they 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 they've uh, incorrectly used their tongues. But let's move on, inshallah. Um, so, the first organ, the eyes, why, have, why is it coming up like this now? Uh, Allahu Akbar. Um, anyway, I normally bring it up as we speak so that it doesn't confuse people. But the first thing Imam Ghazali says is we must protect our eyes from sinful glances. Now, 
when we say sinful glances, it's not only the charms of a woman. That's the second one. And let me just put in my own one, which I added into this, because that must have been the intention. It cannot only be that men mustn't look at the charms of a woman. Women must also not look at the charms of a man. It's equally haram. And whether we do it in a way where we do it either in, 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 to a physical person or whether it's indirectly through photos or videos or cell phone, uh, use of cell phones or even at the various shopping malls or uh, 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 events that we attend. It's an easy one to describe because everyone will quickly know what one is talking about. You don't need to, 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 to be an a exceptionally clever person to understand the point. The more difficult part is how to control it. And there's a hadith that says, uh, Imam Ghazali reminds us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises exhilarating sweetness of worship. Sweetness of worship for those who lower their gazes and abstain from sinful glances. Sweetness of worship, how we all long for that. How we all long for that. We do what we must do, but we don't feel that sweetness. And one of the ways that Allah promises, our Creator promises that one of the ways to achieve this is to control your eyes and make sure that you use it for the right things. But it's not only that we must control our eyes not to look at the opposite sex only, <coughs> but any forbidden acts. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it is gambling or uh, drinking or any sinful activity. Don't go near it. Don't put your eyes at risk of seeing these wrong things. Make sure that if you know that that is going to happen, that you rather avoid it. Um, <clears throat> I almost want to, 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 to uh, yes, <laughs> I'm going to take a chance. <laughs> I wasn't going to say this. <laughs> but while I was preparing for this, I, I, I thought that's an example of it. It's not a great example. You might find it funny, but I'm going to quote you an example. This woman phoned the police station. <coughs> Old woman, probably about 70 something, almost 80, phoned the police station and she said she wants to lay a complaint. Um, and this is her address. The neighbors, are swimming in the nude. So the person asked, um, is it a problem for you? So she says, yes, of course it's a problem. So they sent the police van out. And the police came there. Um, so they said, where is this happening? So she said, there, next door. So he said, um, yeah, but there's a, there's a wall around your place. She so said, of course you won't see it. You have to stand on the ladder. You have to stand on the ladder to see what's going on next door. Do you understand what I'm saying? We know that there's something wrong there. And you make the effort to see the wrong. And you complain about the wrong. If you know there's wrong there, then stay away from it. What we must realize is that every single limb in our body, every single limb will have the ability to speak. 
like we speak to one another, and it can be understood, every limb will have the ability to speak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created that ability in our limbs, in the akhirah, to be able to speak, so that they can testify for or against us how we utilized those particular limbs while we were, were on the dunya. So we must be careful when we use the eyes. Now the eyes, 80%, scientists say 80% of knowledge that we acquire whilst we're on this dunya comes via the eyes, 80%. If your eyes are looking at something, it communicates it to the brain. And if it's a powerful thing, then that image from the brain is communicated to the heart and it fills the heart with whatever you are busy with. So now you stop looking, whatever it is, but your mind and your heart is still filled with that. With that. How can the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala penetrate a heart that's full with such dirty and filthy images? So we must be very careful. What we are advised to do is to lower our gazes. Now you all know this already. But I am not here to only remind you that you must lower your gaze because there's something that is will be a reminder because you know it already your test and my test is how are we going to make this a reality not knowledge now to know that you must lower your gaze we all know that but how many of us truly lower our gazes especially when it comes to the opposite sex especially when it comes to the opposite sex. Sometimes it's not, uh, it's not done in an obvious way, but Allah knows, and your eyes know, and your eyes will testify, and Allah, Allah will know that whether the eyes, when it testifies, is telling the truth or not, and then you can't hide. Because on the day of Yom al -Qiyamah, when your limbs speak, they can only speak the truth. So we must use the eyes, firstly to, to, to not look at the uh, charms of the opposite sex, but we must also not use the eyes in an envious way. Look at what other people have, what they possess, the qualities they have, abilities they have, children they have, uh, jobs that they have. That's where the nafs, the nafs will come with a way of trying to justify why it is a problem, because then you become envious. Yo, he's not even this or that, but look what he's got. He only uh, 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 passed standard uh, 8 or grade 10 or whatever you want to call it, and look. He's so wealthy, he's got this and that, and did you see he's got an... Leave that stuff. Ultimately, we must remember what others have. Allah has decreed it like that. Allah has decreed it that whatever you see other people have, Allah has decreed it for them to have it. Whether they are Muslim or not Muslim, whether they are sinners or not sinners, what they have, is the decree of Allah. It's the will of Allah. Because if it was not the will of Allah, how could they have had it? So in that is a, a great test for us. That when we look at, when we look at the, um, the things that other people possess and the qualities that they have, let's not be envious about it. And your eyes, have a very, very important role. And if you consciously
translate that and you say, if that is Allah's will, then I am satisfied. And what Allah has willed for me, I am satisfied with that, without comparing yourself to other people. We must, we must uh, read the Quran, of course, use your eyes to read the Quran and use it to, 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 to engage in, um, in, in beneficial stuff and activity. Don't use it for, 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 for things that you know are going to be a problem. Now, yes, Yunus? Um, yeah, Tassali. Yes. Just on the eyes, subhanAllah, I mean, if, if, if we look to how we've all been under, under lockdown, um, in this time, we haven't ventured out into malls and visiting people. So we, with, with the concept of having to lower our gaze, you know, became slightly easier, but even more difficult. Because now, because we have this free time, we more engage with our phones and our computers and our laptops and our TVs. Astaghfirullah. May Allah forgive us. <laughs> so, so, it's so easy easy especially one looks to our social media platforms like facebook for example how many other posts of people that we see and people's profile pictures and um, memes that are shared might not be healthy for the eyes concerning what we've just discussed instagram you know so as much as we try to avoid it shouting at us from all angles all the time um, and that's just a little caution that um, this lesson has now brought because how quickly can we get distracted by a, a post and exactly that thought of having whatever we witness get internalized within our psyche sure and it's so dangerous yeah and it doesn't leave when the vision goes away it remains behind in a different form in your heart and your mind. And what it leaves behind is dirt. We're in the process of wanting to clean our hearts. I don't want to spend a lot of time on, on, on the ears because we know that the big, big problem with the ears is when we use it for slander and backbiting. Now, Imam Ghazali says that in the same way that um, food that you take in can be either good or bad, in the same way what comes in through the ears goes to the heart and mind which can be good or bad. So we must protect the ears. It's not a, a, a thing that any, a, a, anything that comes can walk through that door. It must be a door that you open it must be something when, 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 when somebody comes to you and wants to talk about other people. Then find an excuse to get out of that relationship. Find an excuse not to listen or change the topic to something more positive. But the moment you listen, you have become a partner in that bad act. You can't say, I only listened. The person will only speak to somebody who is listening. He's not going to stand in front of the mirror and speak to himself. He's going to speak to somebody that's going to give him a hearing. And by you giving a hearing, you are helping him to slander and to backbite others. And that is, oh, subhanallah, it's, it's, it, I, I don't have to uh, explain. There's enough said, there's enough hadith on backbiting and slander because the cost at the end of the day will be that you will have to pay that person back. Even you that doesn't listen, you didn't say anything, but you listen, you made it possible. You will have to give from your deeds, your good deeds to the person that, that was slandered. We should rather make time to use our ears for beneficial things. Let me move on, um, because this was one that we covered when, when previously when we did the 
um, other sessions. The same applies to the to the tongue. I'm not going to uh, uh, go much more, but the point that uh, uh, Sister Aisha made about the tongue, the tongue, the tongue is considered as potentially the most dangerous limb of the body. So what we should do is we should keep it moist with the dhikr and the salawat and the rec recitation of the Quran. Then you know you are protecting it from being used for the wrong reasons. What, what did we say in the first stage? <laughs> Have we forgotten what we said in the first stage? Eat less, sleep less, talk less. Don't talk unnecessary, aimless stuff. You don't even know what you want to say, but you, you, you're talking. You're not even sure what the, how you're going to conclude the point that you are making or what your next point is, but you want to keep on talking. Don't do aimless stuff like that. Rather sit and reflect and spend your time in a useful way because time is precious. It's something that once it's gone, it's gone. And you're going to have to account for every single second. Like for your wealth, every single second of your time must be accounted for. Don't waste it. Let me go on to the, to, to the next slide. The heart. Allahu Akbar, Subhanallah. <coughs> the heart is something that can also develop diseases, and we're going to de deal with the with with those things. But the heart is an organ in the body. I'm talking the spiritual component of the heart. <coughs> The heart is in flux. It's in a state of flux. It's, it's ready to be influenced. And it's constantly being fed information that comes from the mind. So if we look at our organs, uh, the senses, the eyes, the ears, the hands, the tongue, all of those things, whatever information is coming, via the senses to the mind is fed to the heart. The state of the heart determines what it accepts and what it does not accept. It can quickly change from one situation to another. And any, anything that is within your focus or what you are busy with influences the heart. New ideas and thoughts, the whisperings of shaitan, and the whisperings of the malaika also. Not only the bad, but the good and the bad comes to you from different quarters in different ways. And depending on the state of your heart, your heart can be changed from one state to another. And Imam Ghazali says, that there are four factors which corrupt the heart. Of course, there are much, much more, uh, but he lists four factors. And the first one he lists is uh, worldly ambition. Now let's hear, why is worldly ambition? Why is, is this listed as a factor that can corrupt the heart? Imam Ghazali radiallahu an says, let's hear. The first thing that comes to, to my mind with the Sali is um, it makes us forget about death because we are so focused with our worldly ambitions and goals and desires that it's so far into the future, per se, that we forget about our own death. And we advise to always remember the destroyer of, of joy and happiness, which is death, according to the Prophet So that's, that's one of it, yeah. Shukran. Let's hear. Anyone else? Why? Is ambition bad? 
uh, uh, shouldn't we have ambition? Allah says we must strive for excellence in everything that we do. So why is ambition considered as bad? Aisha? Um, I suppose if you're very ambitious, you're very driven to reach your goal and come what may, your focus is just on, on reaching that that goal, that it becomes an obsession, um, force, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Assalamu alaikum, Habibi. Yes. Ah, salam. Shukran for granting us the opportunity. Alhamdulillah. Um, I would probably say um, where the ambition is concerned is um, you get so lost in determining your outcome and yet Allah is in control of that if, I, if I'm right. And um, that you tend to lose focus um, in your ambition to reach um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, commands first of all and um, um, then that sort of derail you from your um, in getting nearer to Allah I would understand Alhamdulillah, not... Alhamdulillah. I, I, although the answers that the others gave were, were good answers I was looking to hear what you said now MashaAllah if you make your ambitions so important in your life then they stand between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you get so engrossed in the world if you really think of uh, whether it is a position that you are striving for um, then your heart and your mind and your actions are all filled with how can I get to this position where is is the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so one of the things that we are warned against it's not necessarily bad to have ambition but ambition for the right things but in a balanced way don't let your ambition stand in the way of you getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is one of the key reasons why uh, it is it is being cited but let's move on Inshallah. Um, so, so worldly ambition is is raised by Imam Ghazali as something that is dangerous. Oh, he doesn't go into all the detail of the. Okay. Or oh, did I mix the slides up now? Anyway. We said the gateway to the heart and the mind are our five senses. Smelling, hearing, talking and all of those things, right? But the heart is the, between the material world, our physical world and the unseen world, the ghaib is a door that the mind cannot go through. What, how, how does the mind explain something that it doesn't know, doesn't understand, it doesn't understand the, the laws? The mind is, is incapable of knowing, understanding, or going through that door of the unseen. The only thing that can take you through that door is your spiritual heart. And it is only with the spiritual heart that you can get true knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot get true knowledge with a mind, no matter how clever you are, and stop thinking you are clever. Because the more clever you are, the further you go back. The more you think you are clever, the further you are going back, you are not making progress. When you realize how little you know, in comparison to what there is to know, then you are in the right path. Then you start realizing the only one that knows, truly knows, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
and you actually know nothing. Now, that consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and acquiring true knowledge can only be done with a spiritual heart. Now, your higher self and your lower self, <coughs> they, it's like the heart is a battleground and the forces of goodness and the forces of corruption and evil, they stand on either side of this battleground and they fight all the time for control of that area. What is that area? That area is the heart. Because once they control the heart, they control the actions of the person. It's where the phys physical world meets the ghaib or the unseen world. That's how, how it's been described by, 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 by uh, some of the scholars. So the forces of good and bad are always trying to infiltrate and contact, have, have control uh, over, the, over the heart. Now, a concept that's not easy to understand is that the heart is a spiritual heart. The eyes, we've got physical eyes, but there is a spiritual equivalent. There's of every single sense that you have. Whether it's your eyes or your ears or your tongue, there's a spiritual equivalent. Where are these uh, spiritual equivalents? I'm, if I ask you, where, where are they? Would you be able to answer? Because where has to do with space. <laughs> it's a place. Where is a place? Whether it's far or near or, or whatever, but you are referring to a place where we are talking about this dunya and this dunya you can define the space it's got length and breadth and depth but now we're talking about the ghaib subhanallah how do you describe where when you don't know how where applies in the unseen world so it's not it's not necessary. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a wasted exercise to try and say, so where is your spiritual eye? Some people say it's bet uh, on your forehead, between your, your eyes, it's your third eye and all of that. It's neither here nor there to know where it is, to know that you have these spiritual senses. But is it developed? That is the question. Can you see with your spiritual eyes? Can you hear with your spiritual eyes? That is something that can be achieved. We'll go through the, the other levels of the nafs and we will see how people can actually achieve that. But it's important to know that the heart has spiritual equivalents of our physical senses. It's almost like the body uh, with uh, looking at the heart and the heart has both mouth, ear, eyes, tongue, whatever. It can taste, it can hear, it can see. But those things must be developed. And it depends on the state and the level of purification of the heart before one even becomes aware of it. Before you can use it in a particular way like some of the knowers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the awliya developed sufficiently these spiritual senses where we refer to it as miracles. Miracle, another word for miracle is something which is extraordinary. Extraordinary, extra means out of the ordinary, not normal. 
for us in the material world it's not normal for them it's par for the course they've developed the senses they can use it in whatever way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them the ability and even these senses that they are given are given where it has levels upon levels upon levels so maybe the person can see through the wall other people can see through through countries <laughs> through the sea through physical obstructions uh, doesn't limit what they can see or what they can hear or how they can travel and these things we all refer to as the olia as 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 the karamat uh, uh, karama or, or, or the, 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 the ability to do things that's out of the ordinary. Sure, I didn't know I was going to take so long on this, but I better just quickly touch on this. <coughs> the only way we can develop these senses Remember what we are, are busy with, brothers and sisters. Um, we are trying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's just pause for a moment. We are trying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've been given physical bodies, but we also have a higher self, a spiritual self. As we grow up, as babies, we almost behave instinctively like animals in the same way that they uh, behave instinctively. But as we grow older and we reach puberty, we start thinking and now we become conscious of our actions. We now have to develop a way of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your material world, you've been born in it. You have to live your life here, good or bad. This is the time where you're going to earn Jannah or you're going to earn Jahannam for your time on the dunya. So this is where it's going to happen and where you're going to be tested. Even though our instinctive animalistic nafs has such a lot of control over us when we are born yes i know what people say that uh, children are born uh, pure we're not talking about that aspect we're talking about how their bodies react and respond instinctively to the stimuli around them when they are young as they grow older, they can control it more and determine what they want to do and what they not want to do. That want to do this and not do that is actually choice. And how we exercise choice is the test of why we are in this dunya. Are we going to choose the right when we are confronted with both right and wrong? And as you succeed in curbing and controlling the nafs, then the animalistic behavior that you have nurtured and fed all your life, it starts losing its control over you. And then that higher self, the spiritual self, you, that door gets open and the veils are lifted and the heart becomes purified and you are able to know, understand and travel through the unseen. And then you get blessed with pure wisdom and tasting knowledge. So the path of tazkiyah, purification of the heart, is the only route, the only route of how we are going to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And fundamental to this purification process is our belief, our aqidah, our monotheism. 
must be unshakable. How can you get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you don't know Allah? That's why when we say Allah, if somebody asks you, where is Allah? Can you with certainty answer that question? Is Allah in you? Are you in Allah? Can you answer that question? If you can't, you better make time and effort so that you can understand it and have certainty of belief. And you get that when you go through this process of the purification of the heart. Now when we say purifying the heart, purifying the heart from what? What must we purify, purify the heart from? From anything which is not Allah. In other words, the heart we said as contesting, two contesting forces, good and bad, contesting for space. In your heart, if goodness fills your heart, then you are getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the bad and the evil and the corrupt issues fill your heart, then you are moving further away from Allah. Then your heart is less purified, it's dirty, it's filthy. But a pure heart, only a pure heart, what is referred to as Kalbun Salim, can actually accommodate and be filled with the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anything, and when we say, what is anything other than Allah? Anything that emanates from creation. Because if it's not Allah, it was created by Allah. That which is not Allah, is created by Allah. Nothing, nothing exists unless it was created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the heart can be considered, it's not a simple uh, dimension where you say the heart, it's just one entity. It's actually somewhat complicated. We make it, we make it uh, uh, easy when we say the heart as if it's just one location, simple location. The heart has many rooms in it. And the different rooms are connected to the different minor idols that we worship. The minor idols, what, what are the minor idols? The things that take up all this time in our lives and engross us. And the only time we really think of Allah, oh, as Maghrib, it must Allah. Dan dan je, oh ya, it must khats Allah. Wana ye je ge dink van Allah. When did you think of Allah before that? Think back through your day. And when did you consciously think of Allah? Even sometimes we make dhikr. We make dhikr in an automatic way that it's not even done with consciousness. We say, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. But je dink van, ye ek is laat. I I I I I I I I must rush. I must get there. But you're making dhikr. It's better to, to do the, the, the dhikr than not do the dhikr. I'm not saying don't do it. But rather make time for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a conscious way. Because the more conscious you are of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more those things that take up so much importance in your life, the less influence they will have on directing your physical behavior and activity. Do you really think about Allah when you stand in front of the mirror you're going to work now? Man or woman, in fact some people say that men are worse than women, uh, when they're going out now, there's going to be other people. Now you, <laughs> it's not your spouse now, it's who you're going to meet on the other side. Not meet in a, in a, in a meeting way, but you're going to be exposed to other uh, uh, people generally from the opposite sex so now uh, my shirt doesn't look right doesn't match with my pants or my skirt 
Um, and now you change it quickly to a thermos. Who are you changing that for? <laughs> Where is Allah when you stand there and you're getting dressed? Can you see how clothes can become such a big idol? You go to the shop, you've got so many shoes, already pairs of shoes, but you go and buy another pair of shoes. Where is your mind when you go to the shop and you see, wow, that's a nice pair of shoe, shoes. And you go in, what informs that? And it's the same goes for the car and the house and your money and your job. And we take all of those things together. All the rooms in your heart are filled with something or the other. And each one controls that area. Where is the place for Allah in your heart, in a heart like that? You know, that's why they refer to it as the idols. You say you don't believe in idols? When we stand in front of Allah, you will be tested of what importance you attach to that as compared to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now when the heart is filled with goodness, so each of these rooms we must fill. Now you can't take the room like we do it uh, uh, when we're at home. Um, you chuck out all the stuff and you put it outside and you say the room is now clear. It's not that easy to do it with a heart. Each one of these things, you see the problem with us, all of us, I include myself, is we can talk about these things, we can explain it, but the test is how do we implement it? How do we implement it in our lives? And that is the difficult thing. It's so, so difficult to implement it in a real, meaningful way, where the knowledge, the power of the knowledge that Allah commanded us to go and seek, that Rasulullah gave so many hadith about go seek knowledge, go seek knowledge, the power of that knowledge lies in implementing the knowledge. If we don't implement the knowledge, we're going to get a hiding second to none. I want to just quickly do this one. We've done this before in uh, other sessions, but let me just quickly do this one, just so that we get the idea now of the heart. We're talking about the heart. This is the heart. It's a pink heart. <laughs> Did you see that? When I press the button, those things that surrounds the heart are veils. These veils are called veils of darkness. and they on the outside of the, of the heart. Now we said the mind and the heart speaks to one another all the time. All the time, until you die, the heart will speak to the mind, the mind will speak to the heart, and back and forth and back and forth, that back and forth discussion between the heart and the mind takes place all the time. The one tries to impact on the other and to influence. The heart tries to influence what the mind must do and the mind based on the influence of shaitan nafs and the dunya as it gets it through the five senses tries to take what is coming through that way and tries to fill the heart with that okay now the mind and the heart speaks to one another and there's a place where they meet Then you have the heart within the heart. The heart of the heart. And that is where the Ruch lives. But it's filled with, did you see this? Those are veils also. Veils of light. 
Now, veils of light are there to protect the heart, the spiritual heart. Because if the pure nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of even of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if your heart was exposed to the pure nur, it will suddenly disintegrate. The heart can only cope with a certain amount of it. And then Allah in his mercy put veils of light around it. So as the heart gets more purified, it's able to cope with more, then Allah lifts the veils. Then the heart can cope with more of the nur and more illumination. And then as that happens, and you, you become a better person, then Allah loves more veils and, 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 and more nur is allowed into the heart. Now we said the mind cannot enter through that door. That's the door where the unseen starts. Knowledge of the unseen and the ability to move, not just know, but to move and make sense of the ghayb, the unseen. Now we're not just talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who's unseen. We're also talking about malaika, the jinn, uh, concepts of Jannah and Jahannam are all part of the unseen. It's not physical things, material things that you can see. Now, at this level, the red, we move from the pink to the red. A heart that's purified, this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants wisdom. You start developing wisdom. Wisdom is not something that they can teach you. No one can teach you wisdom. Wisdom comes as a pure blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people go to uh, university and they study X, Y, and Z. Uh, maybe uh, economics or finance. They study it for years. They teach it at university. But they don't have the wisdom of the trader, the, 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 the guy who sells um, greens, and vegetables on the corner. He's more wise to use that same knowledge in a particular way because Allah granted him wisdom. The other one was granted knowledge. And that comes as a gift purely from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with that wisdom, Allah makes it possible for you to understand and grasp the issues of knowledge of the unseen. Then you have the inner secret. Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah. Allah! <laughs> the inner secret. The home of the Ruh. The home of the Ruh. We're talking the spiritual art. This is where the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deposited in every single human being knowledge of Allah's names when you were still uh, in the f in the form of your ruh you weren't born yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought your ruh together all the ruh of all the people from all times brought them together and Allah taught them all of us Muslim non-Muslim sinner atheist everyone Everyone who can be described as a human being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought their root all together in one place and Allah asked them, Am I your Lord? Allah to be Rabbikum. And we all said, Yes. How did we say yes? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us directly His names. Directly. Not even via the Malaika. Allah asked in San, Nabi Adam to teach the malaika these names. So if we, if we look at that, that every single person 
has the ability to know Allah and is in fact a knower of Allah deep inside your inner secret. Deep inside your inner secret, you actually have true knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, just to conclude on the slide, in this space, uh, the pink part of the heart, if I can refer, you are get, given glimpses of the unseen and glimpses of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just glimpses of the true knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you progress and the veils of light are, 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 are lifted, then you start tasting that knowledge. Not with a, with, with a glass <laughs> and you drink. Taste is a spiritual term that describes what happens to you when you experience, when you go through a spiritual experience. Sometimes the body shows it on the outside. You shiver or you, 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 you go uh, unconscious even. But you taste the knowledge. Not with your mouth, you taste it with your heart. And then if you are of the fortunate ones, subhanallah, like the Arifin and the Uliya and the Prophets, then you drink from that fountain of nur and barakah and knowledge which is limitless, limitless, no end. You can drink forever till your heart can't cope anymore. Your, your own heart has reached its limit, but there is so much more, so much more, so much more. That's why the Oliya, they don't reach a particular stage. They will continue moving from one level and one level to the other level to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better because Allah's knowledge is without limit. There is no limit ever that can be reached about the true knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the glimpse, just the glimpse. We don't, we, 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 we too weak to ever get to the stage of the awliya but may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because Allah is merciful, not because we qualify, we too weak, that Allah gives us a glimpse to assist us, to encourage us, so that we can make more progress on this path of the purification of the heart. And it's something that I want to conclude on, to say that the heart, the heart, the heart, when I present this, then it sounds technical. It sounds technical. Now, how am I going to purify my, my heart? Go back to what Imam Ghazali said. If we go back to what Imam Ghazali says, then the answer is what you said you knew. When we put the slides on. Yeah, I know what about the eyes and the ears and the mouth and the tongue and... Uh, so you know, then why don't you have a pure heart? Because you thought you knew. You thought you knew. We must all go back to the drawing board and take, because this, the, these scholars have written on it. They've traveled this road where they can actually taste and drink the knowledge. They are the ones who have written and, and advised us what to do. Now if we take that advice from them, then it's simple. Control your eyes. Avoid slanderous talk. Have sabr, humility, all. It's so simple, but it's hard to implement. But you know what is harder, brothers and sisters? What is the hardest part? Not the implementation is not the hardest part. The hardest part is to be honest with ourselves. We fool ourselves to say we are this and we are that when we are far off. All of us, and I, I would be so bold to say all of us, are still one foot in the first level. 
where we still have a lot of that animal within our side, uh, within us. We must recognize what it is so that we can take the advice of what has been offered to us so that we can get rid of all these diseases because these diseases are not known to us in, a, in the way that we can know uh, in the material sense or a physical sense. These diseases are known by the experts of the spiritual world and they have given advice and they say sabr, sincerity, humility, all of those things. Now we must apply it in the correct manner. Uh, let me leave it there, uh, brothers and, and, and sisters, and I'm going to uh, open the floor for comment and questions, if there are any questions. The floor is open to whoever would like to make a comment or, 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 or pose a question. Muhammad Farid, mashallah. Can we hear from you? Okay. Or anyone else? Muhammad Fasih? Assalamu alaikum, Prasari. And assalamu alaikum to everyone else in the room. Um, Prasari, uh, as Prasari was describing the veils of darkness and the veils of light and all of these things um for me i and and and, and obviously as Pudisari mentioned going back to Imam Khazali and the training of these senses is because this is how we engage with the world through our senses um what i find interesting is that the tools that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us is that is beyond the reach of an ordinary human being. You don't have to be an intellectual to achieve this. You don't have to be a great scholar to achieve this. It is achievable by ordinary people through following basic steps, through refining what it means to be someone who observes the tongue, to be someone who observes the sight and the hearing. And um, I feel that when you start to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the, re the reason why you hear and the reason why you speak, I think then you fall into the realm of, or, or you come into the realm of the awliya because that they live only for Allah. So whatever resources they have, whatever resources they have, they use that only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake because anything that they can have at their disposal is a way to achieve that uh, closeness and that sense of um, connectedness uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so that is why they use what it was within their capacity. And as profound as these concepts are for ordinary people, it's amazing how simple it is. Although, as Prasad is also outlined, it's simple, but in the same sense, it takes us to really sit with ourselves and understand ourselves. And because we don't understand ourselves yet, that's why we have difficulty uh, in achieving that, that higher state of culture. Alhamdulillah. Any other comment? Uh, even if you just explain how you understand it, because as you explain how you understand it, so it helps somebody else because somebody else might understand it better with your comment or your understanding of it uh, than the way I've explained it. So it's good to hear uh, 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 and, and for people to participate. Assalamu alaikum Tasali. Wa alaikum salam. Um, um, yeah. The, 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 the knowledge we're doing, there's, there's two aspects to knowledge. There is a theoretical and there's the practical. What we're doing at, at this stage is uh, uh, mostly to understand the theoretical part of things, you know. Um, things will only open up for you 
once you start trading the path with the sheikh with with working on yourself then then once you enter the practical uh, you enter the, the suluk right suluk then things would unveil to you at at this stage we need to know all this these things um theoretically yes and it's good to understand it at this stage before you really gonna uh, walk the path of uh, of the saints yeah inshallah inshallah it's my contribution and and i want to mention something else not connection not connected with the with the uh, with the lesson i see we've been uh, over 20 uh, uh, participants this evening uh, next week inshallah if each one can just bring along a friend then we can increase the 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 the, the knowledge uh, dissemination of the knowledge to the wider public inshallah so if each of us can just bring one friend then we can increase the the the, the, the room inshallah ta'ala inshallah shukran imam hussein um any other comment so assalamu alaikum <laughs> it's not easy because um you have a concept of yourself and then you get to know uh, your true weaknesses it's very tough it's a struggle, but Alhamdulillah, I've, I've become patient with myself, and um, I've, I've realized it's the it's the um, intention, and uh, it's not uh, necessarily you might not reach uh, that point, but you know you must have patience with yourself, and Inshallah, it's 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 the intention that comes. Allah. Any any other comment? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, uh, Shahid. Uh, just to iterate on uh, Sidi Pasikh, um, um, what is it? So in 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 retrospect, we we are um, obligated to pull out the our yardstick. Nobody else is bit. Nobody. Um, um, what I mean is pulling out the yardstick, you need to measure yourself. Nobody else knows you better than yourself other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in measuring yourself, and that is the way you go forward. Yeah, I would, I would suspect in, in, in that sense. So pull out the yardstick and measure yourself and, and then uh, that's how you go step by step. By, uh, yeah. Shukran Sidi Shahid. As long as you make the correct reading, no? <laughs> don't take out the measuring tape and then you know it's not that, but you read purposely the wrong thing. Be honest with yourself. <laughs> Admit, eat the feel. I, I, I'm eating far too much. Uh, I, I'm talking too much. Or I, I, I don't do this or I don't do that. I don't give enough time to my family and my friends. I speak in a abrupt way to my to 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 my spouse. Confront these issues. Don't run away from it. That's the first step in finding the solution. If we confront and we admit and we're honest, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very pleased with you. You've taken the first step to recognize what your faults are, which means you are now in a position to correct that fault. Because how can you correct something if you don't recognize it as a problem or as, as, as a fault? So, before I ask any, uh, uh, Imam to make uh, dua for us, are there any other final comments? Mr. Uh, if I just may um, go back to my point, and I think uh, what Mr. Uh, Hussain mentioned was very important. I, I omitted that aspect from it, not because for any other reason, but I was just focusing on the individual and obviously how we 
how we need to work on ourselves, but the sheikh, the spiritual guide, is the one who would have the resources and have the understanding of who we are, uh, have the understanding of what is required of us, uh, what is required to get us to the next level. We all need, uh, for lack of a better uh, example, we all need a uh, uh, in a sense, uh, just like he was Nabi Musa Sheikh. We all need a Sheikh to, 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 who understands the unseen to navigate uh, through that process. So most definitely that is key to, 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 to this process. But what, I'm, what I mean is that even if a person is in the process of getting a Sheikh, hasn't gotten the Sheikh yet, whatever the case may be, um, like Bidda Sadi has mentioned, to constantly be honest with ourselves in terms of if we're being just, if we're being fair with others and with ourselves, um, and even, even the Ramadan is that measure for us to indicate uh, where our limits are, what we can do when we uh, uh, when we put Allah first, how we can build on that. I think if if we live our lives in Ramadan particularly, uh, it would go a long way to helping us reform our consciousness um, in in a, in a better way. But yeah, <laughs> I, I just want to make a concluding comment. Yes, I've explained um, the concept of if we move into the spiritual realm and the unseen world, that with it can come gifts and abilities that is supernatural. The moment, <laughs> the moment we do it, to achieve those gifts, you can be 100% sure you will not get it. 100% sure. Unless Allah is going to grant it to you to test you. But if you do it purely for the sake of purifying your heart in order to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not for any gift and not any benefit, then the gifts will come running to you. It's like the dunya. If you run after the dunya, you'll never catch it. But if you run away from the dunya, the dunya will run after you. <laughs> May we leave it on that note. Uh, and shukran for your attendance. Uh, inshallah, we, we haven't concluded uh, uh, this. There's still a final part that we need to, to do. But then we'll go over to the fourth level, inshallah, uh, during the course of, of the next and we're going to ask Imam Hussein uh, to make the closing du'a for us, inshallah. Uh, uh, Dr. Sali, just a, a quick question. The, the, the book, uh, uh, Degrees of the Soul, uh, are we finished? Degree with Degrees of the Soul? The, we, no, we, we still, we're still only at the, okay. the third level. We must go to the fourth level. <laughs> okay. So, I, so, so, I, so tonight there wasn't actually any mention from, from the book uh, Degrees of the Soul. No, no, I... It was I, more Imam Ghazali which we did. Yeah, but I've included the other aspects okay. uh, which doesn't deal with the tongue and the heart and the stomach, the other aspects. Okay. So I've taken both books. It's difficult, otherwise okay. the questions become too long, but I've taken the two books Degrees of the Soul and mm -mm. the Seven Valleys of Imam Ghazali. I've used that um, and captured what I thought would be the key points in each of the different levels. Yes, yes, yes. I noticed that, yeah. yeah. Shukran, Tasali. Shukran. Imam Hussein. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala asrafil mursaleen. Habibina wa shafi'ina, sayyidina, sanadina, wa kurrata wa ayunina wa maulana Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam wa ashabi ajma'in. Allahumma salli salatan kamilatan wa sallim salaman taman ala sayyidina Muhammadin illadhi tanhalu bil-uqad wa tanfariju bil-qurab wa tugdawa bil-awaij wa tunali bil-ragaib wa husna al-khawatim wa yustaskal ghamama bi-wajjiyil-kareem wa ala ali wa sahbih. 
في كل لمحة ونفس بعدد كل معلوم لك اللهم أرنا الحق حق ورزقنا التباع وأرنا الباطل باطل ورزقنا جتناب اللهم جعلنا من الذين يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وأدخلنا الجنة مع الأبرار يا عزيز يا غفار يا رب العالمين سلامنا للمرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين بسر الفاتحة شكرا بتسالي الحمد لله رب العالمين شكرا امام حسين and to everyone for joining us I hope inshallah that you will join us for the conclusion of this level and the introduction of this next level شكرا جزيلا for your attendance may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide and protect you and your families السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام just just one one question one question بتسالي after you've uh, after regarding our, our other uh, uh, Pro- can we just uh, yes. just one minute yes can I yeah can I just say uh, something to uh, the group um, yes I would urge you to go over the the previous sessions that we've done on the YouTube channel the Salimani YouTube channel we've we've, we've uploaded all the videos from the beginning especially on 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 the um, sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala predestination uh, the names of Allah and we are now busy with the nafs it's good to go over these things because you can't say everything uh, in in one uh, in one go uh, it would be very useful please go through those uh, 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 YouTube um, videos that we have there Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Inshallah. Inshallah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Shukran wa tasali wa salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Assalamu alaikum. Um, Imam Hussain is probably going to be better because I must record this. I'm going to. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa salam, Muhammad. Okay, now, now I, I just wanted to know with Asali if we've got a date for the meeting. Uh, to <laughs> we advise. Yeah, I sent I, I sent a message that the meeting will be tomorrow after Maghrib. I sent it out. Inshallah. On the group, na. Yunus? Inshallah. Okay. Not yet. Yeah. I'll, I'll phone. I'll, Yunus, just phone me and say now after this. Just okay. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm going to end now. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.